You got it. People are trickling in. Give it another second. I think that we were wrapping up our um, keynote for today. So I'm sure that people are joining after that completed. I'm not gonna wait too long though, because we have a precious 30 minutes here. Great to see some familiar names. Thank you all for joining us. I'm going to get started because we have a limited, a limited time with this um, prestigious uh, featured speaker. Um, I want to welcome you all to um, this is the first of our feature, uh, featured speakers for the SciComm 2022 conference. Um, I'm Heather Aiken. I'm a faculty member in agricultural leadership, education, and communication. You've probably seen my name because we've been sending many emails and, and um, information about this conference. Um, I'll be monitor, um, moderating the session. We are gonna have the chat open for questions. I think Dietram will kind of keep an eye on it, but I'll keep an eye on it too so we um, can catch any comments, questions, things like that. Um, you can post any questions there. Um, so I'm really pleased to introduce Dietram Schäufele who will be giving a talk um, um, on is there such a thing as too much concern about trust? I'm really excited about this topic because uh, issues of trust and knowledge have come up numerous times in this conference so far. And uh, um, it seems like we really sort of need this um, need this information that Dietram will be sharing with us today. Um, he is the Taylor Bascom Chair in Science Communication and Bilis Distinguished Achievement Professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and in the Mortgage Institute for Research. Um, he's also a Distinguished Research Fellow at the University of Pennsylvania's Annenberg Public Policy Center. Um, he's an elected member or fellow of many prestigious scientific organizations. I'm not going to list them all here. I'll go ahead and put our a uh, web page for him in the chat so you can look that over. Um, he currently co-chairs the National Academy of Sciences um, Standing Committee on Advancing Science Communication and has co-organized five National Academies Colloquia on the Science of Science Communication. Um, and some of those, there was a recent one just a couple of months ago, and I really encourage you guys to check out the videos that are there um, from that colloquium. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dietram. Awesome. Thank you so much, Heather. And um, um, I was joking before we we jumped on that that my career has completely been reduced now to to small um, um, internal academic titles that that probably means that I have have very little real world impact anymore if I have to list those in my bio. But I nonetheless appreciate the uh, the very kind introduction. Um, what I want to do, um, and I'm just going to share my screen here really quickly. Um, uh, what I want to do is to give you, Heather said information, um, and I think some of that will be information, but I also want to make some arguments that hopefully will stir a bunch of discussion, and, and I'll keep it as short as possible um, to, to hear back. As, as, and as Heather said, I'm happy to, if people want to jump in while I talk, um, uh, that's totally fine. My chat window actually disappeared the moment I started screen sharing. So Heather, if I could ask you, if anybody jumps in and has a question, just interrupt me, please. Um, what I'm what I want to offer is like four thoughts. Um, one, um, and it's, it's it's all driven by a piece uh, that I do want to, where I want to make sure that I give credit to to the lead author Nikki Krauss, who is a doctoral student and a researcher in our department, Isabel Freiling, who just started as an assistant professor at the University of Utah, who was a Fulbright visiting with us at the time, and then Dominique Broussard, our department chair. Um, a piece that we wrote for the American Scientist. Um, um, called the the trust fallacy and and some of the arguments that I'm presenting here are based on that and 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 the first one is that we spend a lot of time looking for pathologies for something that's wrong with the public and trying to fix it and I want to 
put forth the thought that that may not always be the most productive way of doing science communication. Um, I, I will also throw out uh, maybe a blasphemous uh, thought, and that is that not all science communication is good, and sometimes it's gratuitously bad and, and doesn't help. Um, all of that, of course, is exacerbated by human nature, not just among non-expert publics, but also among scientists. Um, and then kind of ending with 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 a, what what Heather already queued up, meaning where and trust and what we should be worried about. So let me start with an idea of, of public pathologies, because very often, and I, I, I find it a very unfortunate term, we refer to science denialism or anti-science sentiment. There are recent pieces in PNAS and elsewhere uh, that have talked about this. And in most cases, I will push back that that or I would argue that viewpoints about science or what, what is perceived to be anti-science are actually based very much on, on scientific arguments and considerations. So epistemologically, there is, we're not that far apart. Um, some of you will remember the now infamous um, Seralini study uh, on, on rats that, that, uh, that allegedly get, get cancer at higher rates if they eat genetically modified maize. Uh, that was, of course, withdrawn or retracted, rather, and then republished in, in Europe based on methodological flaws, small control groups, litter effects, and so on. Um, and you will remember the Lancet piece that, 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 that tried to argue that there is a link or show uh, between autism and, and vaccinations. Uh, Wakefield lost his medical license over it, got retracted. The argument that anti-science folks, as they sometimes are called, are making is isn't it weird that this stuff got got through peer review? It was it was carefully evaluated by the scientific community, and then once it got published, and either industry or other areas of science pushed back, then they retracted it. So they're actually making what we call anti-science. They're making very scientific arguments, and they're saying something is wrong in the scientific system. And that's exactly, of course, what we saw for COVID uh, when we walked right into that situation by by correcting misinformation by intervening. With science that itself didn't turn out to be right. Um, and uh, Laura Ingram on the conservative side saying, next time they tell you to trust science, just remember how much of it turned out to be wrong or questionable during COVID. Hasn't stopped us from trying to cure those pathologies. We started with knowledge deficits and everybody now says, yeah, we know that that doesn't work. Just because people learn more about science doesn't mean they become more supportive. That doesn't stop many of the popularizers of science um, and I put Neil deGrasse Tyson here to do that anyway. I'm going to tell you the right science. I'm going doing a mic drop, and then the world is a better place. That has then been replaced by saying, well, it's maybe it's not knowledge. Maybe it's trust. Maybe there's a trust deficit, and I'll come back to which degree that is was actually true during COVID. And if we can address that, then that's better. Um, then, then the world will be a better place. Again, little evidence that trust um, that there's a trust deficit, or that there are even some of the gaps, at least not in the way we typically intuit them. Then we said, well, if we tell better stories, then the world is going to be a better place, right? If, if we just get the narrative right. Um, again, the attempt that saying science is right, the public is wrong, and if we get the narrative right, they will start seeing the light. And then during COVID, of course, we repackaged the whole thing of a knowledge deficit, um, and now call it a misinformation deficit model, meaning it's not if people knew the science, if they knew the right science, they know the wrong science. And if they knew the right science, then they would do all the right things. And again, very limited evidence that that's actually true. Uh, many of you, of course, have seen um, a, a, a data on why knowledge deficits um, repackaged as misinformation deficits or not don't work. But here's just one quick illustration from some of our own work here in Wisconsin. Uh, on embryonic stem cell research, grouping people and multi, this is a, these are multivariate models controlling out a whole bunch of stuff. But on the right hand side, you see people uh, that are highly knowledgeable based on knowledge quizzes that we give them in surveys and people who are not knowledgeable um, or less knowledgeable. And then asking how supportive they are of embryonic stem cell research. Unsurprisingly, less religious people show a nice increase, almost a knowledge deficit, right? The more they know, the more. Um, support if they get except for highly religious people, and that's almost half of the of the country if you do a median split, um, completely flatlined. It's not that they don't know, it's that what they know or what, what the scientific facts are end up contradicting with values or policy preferences. And we saw, of course, the exact same thing during COVID. 
So earlier I said somewhat provocatively that that some sometimes scientists gratuitously don't don't help or make things worse, and I just want to show you um, a couple of of thoughts. And and uh, this is data that that many of you have seen. There are different versions of it. Pippa Norris at Harvard collects them. Pew collects them. Uh, that basically maps uh, religious the 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 strength of religious belief the the average strength of religious belief in a country relative to some measure of development on the x in this case gdp per capita and you can kind of see up here right the countries where a, a large proportion of the population self identifies as highly religious um tend to be lower on the development scale with china being a, a notable exception and on the higher end you have a lot of the european countries canada and then literally off the chart the us um, right here, meaning highly religious country, which already explains that previous slide that I showed you about stem cell research. But it also gives you a pretty good sense why this tweet, for example, from Neil deGrasse Tyson on Christmas Day, the date the date is important here, um, may not help on this day long uh, uh, on this day long ago, a child was born who by the age of 30 would transform the world. Happy birthday, Isaac Newton. Kind of funny, except for trolling Christians on the holiest of days, it's probably not the opener for a conversation that says, now let's talk about embryonic stem cell research or tissue engineering. Um, Michael Mann, climate scientist who just went to uh, University of Pennsylvania from Penn State, um, and uh, won, among other things, the AAAS Public Engagement Award, routinely tweeting that nobody who's a conservative should be in Congress, they're just not safe to have in Congress. Again, clearly signaling signaling value differences with a political group and then saying so now let's talk about climate which is really one of our biggest disconnects um with with conservative audiences probably not helping and then i'll just throw in for good measure um richard dawkins who mocks everybody who has any religious belief or has any moral concerns about durham embryonic work um science content wise i agree with all of these guys obviously um, um the problem is the communication may not be um, particularly productive. And I just want to show you the latest round of data from the NORC at University of Chicago. This is the foundation of, of what the NSF and the National Science Board publish as the science indicators every other year. The chapter seven typically talks about public attitudes. And this is where you see the trust, uh, the levels of, of confidence in the scientific community plotted over time and by partisanship. And we see a pretty dramatic gap opening up between 2018 and 2021, right? So this seems to suggest that, oh, look, um, con conservatives are much less likely to trust science than Democrats. Absolutely true. But that gap is actually largely and partly, partly and largely driven by Democrats who are showing historically high levels of, of confidence. And they don't have confidence necessarily in nuclear energy or gene drives. They have confidence in science as a, as a partisan tool. Biden saying science is back, we're not Trump. Um, basically this has now become a, a partisan badge of honor as I said in the, in the title and the tricky part of the slide. And the tricky part is if you add up independents and conservatives, those are seven in 10 Americans. Seven in 10 Americans self-identifies either independent or conservative and we're losing those. So yes, we're gaining ground with, with partisan Democrat um, big D Democrat audiences, but we're also losing ground with conservatives and potential independents. And the moment science is seen as a partisan enterprise, we're in deep, deep trouble. How that plays out, I think COVID, or, or how much and how deeply we can get ourselves into trouble, COVID really nicely demonstrated. Um, many of you have heard about motivated reasoning. Um, Dan Kahan kind of repackaged it as, as, as cultural recognition, um, but, but basically all focusing on the same idea, and that is the reason why, why, why we're in, 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 in such trouble potentially is because of human nature making things worse. Um, we know that, that when, I, when we all agree that certain facts are true about climate change, about uh, gene drives, about um, neurological organoids, uh, or whatever new area of science may be emerging, then we all weigh more heavily those facts that fit our priors, our prior beliefs, values, religious views, ideologies, and we count less disconfirmation biases, those that don't fit. So in other words, we make new science fit our own beliefs rather than adjusting our beliefs based on new scientific evidence. And of course, we do all of that 
as we saw during COVID, partly to to signal and to protect our our, our ideologies um, or and our political identities. This is this could be my grocery store and the near west side here in Madison, with every faculty member wearing a mask and 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 judging the person uh, who's not buying organic apples and not wearing a, a mask. Um, the tricky part, of course, is it we end up believing misinformation or 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 certain facts, um, regardless of, of if they're true or not, even if we could have easily figured it out. That's one side effect. Uh, these are all things that went around on my social media feed uh, about things that Trump has allegedly said or what Trump supporters are, how completely conspiratorial they are in their thinking. All of these, of course, are fake. Um, but people with PhDs, highly educated, forwarded them because they wanted them to be true. Here's the more powerful um, um, example because it, it really shows how much of a problem we're having. Uh, this is data from early in the pandemic um, that Axios collected. Um, and where they asked people, and I'll just highlight these two, uh, do you think that the official numbers at the CDC that the government is putting out are actually correct? If you ask Democrats, two thirds think that no, those numbers are not correct. They're too low. And in, in all likelihood and reality, they're higher. Why? Because Trump is not a good president. I don't like him. He's not doing a good job. So by definition, those numbers cannot be right. Otherwise, my, my political views are challenged. If I'm a Republican, a relative majority, two in five, think that those numbers are exaggerations. Why? Because I'm a Republican. I like Trump. He's doing a good job. So clearly, it can't be as bad as the government tells me to. Either way, in a situation where, where both sides of the political aisle no longer trust the facts that the government puts in front of them, because of motivated reasoning and because of, of, of a desire to protect their identities. So let me quickly talk about that last piece of how much trust is enough. And I just wanna invoke, and hopefully I'm not um, too far in yet and I have a few more minutes left, um, invoke a concept that many of you know, the idea of, of uh, postmodern science um, and I, uh, uh, post-normal science, excuse me. Uh, and the idea of post-normal science, of course, assumes that 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 most science in the in, in as as the scientific enterprise developed um, in in modern societies ended up basically being characterized a by how much uncertainty surrounds that science. So, um, as we think about new CRISPR applications, do we know how off-target effects work and and what their likely long-term effects are? And the decision stakes, meaning if we screw it up, how bad are the consequences? And for the early stages of applied science, I think we underappreciated both to some degree, right? The, the steam engine, um, we applied it and, and, and we thought there weren't all that many uncertainties and probably not uh, decision stakes that were quite high, except for 200, 250 years later, we realized that with climate change and other things, obviously um, that was not true, but it was not as bad yet as what we saw, for example, for nuclear energy, where we started pushing with the Manhattan Project from within science for an investment uh, in something that we were hoping would, would stop the Nazis from getting a nuclear bomb. And so we got one. And you saw already how the uncertainties and the decision stakes went up of, of that professional consultancy, um, as the original authors of this called it. And now, of course, we're in this, in this time of post-normal science, where um, for CRISPR, for neurological organoids, for certain areas of, of AI, uh, for, for, um, for cellular uh, uh, resurrection. Uh, you, some of you saw that article in the Times a little while ago. Um, the stakes are extremely high if we get it wrong, if we make edits to the human germline, for instance, and those get passed along, faulty edits. And, we, and there's also a lot we don't know yet. COVID, of course, was the exact same one, right? There seemed to be a lot of really smart applications. Immediately, we had contact tracing. Um, of course, those apps also immediately were used by law enforcement um, for geofence warrants and other things. So a lot of unintended consequences. Um, this is a graph you're not supposed to be able to read. It's just to remind me um, when in New York City, when they first um, kept their shelter in place, uh, 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 when they first put their shelter in place, um, rules in place, what ended up happening is that you could see that highly educated people, A, did it much more quickly and, and much more um, uh, at, at much higher percentages. Why? Because they could afford to work from home uh, than people who are less affluent, who, who work in jobs that they simply can't do from home. 
Um, and uh, and so you already saw a lot of the, the the unintended consequences opening up, which is exactly where science um, kind of it, it, it is 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 torn still in its approaches. Uh, Naomi Oreskes just came out in Scientific American uh, with a new argument with a new piece where she's arguing that science should stay away from policy recommendations, which is kind of a repackaged um, older idea, but but uh, but will certainly make waves. Um, and 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 the the but she's absolutely right on the on the general merit of the argument that is science can tell us what the scientific outcomes are of certain policy choices, but it cannot ask us what those choices should be. Those are inherently democratic, small d democratic, or political choices. Um, and I want to end up with a few maybe inconvenient questions. Um, and one is um, how much trust, as we're now all thinking about a world post-COVID, is actually functional for society. So if this is societal trust and this is these are the democratic benefits, then at the bottom end, too little trust becomes has a negative benefit, right? It does damage. If none of us on average trust science, we have a real problem. But if all of us blindly trust science as science is pushing forward, we also have a problem because there are clearly applications and 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 areas of science that that raise important moral, ethical, uh, regulatory, political questions that need much broader debate. So, realistically, probably we should be somewhere in the middle. But where that point is, I think we have had very little discussion about. And right now, we seem very very excited about rebuilding trust, and ideally, everybody trusts science, and then the world is is a better place. That may not be reasonable and it may not be deserved. Um, my second point, um, many of you remember uh, HeLa cells, Henrietta Lacks, uh, research being done without consent or people not being treated in Tuskegee or elsewhere, um, just as a lawnmower is going fast outside, my apologies. And we often say, well, trust among certain populations may just be especially for, among African-Americans, it's it's just historical, and and we just need to re-earn it. Well, that may be true, except for if I'm an African American mother today, I have a three times higher chance than a white mother to die at some point between conception and childbirth. So that's not a matter of rebuilding trust. That's a matter of real inequities on August seventeenth, twenty twenty two, that need to be addressed. And to say, well, we need to rebuild trust based on historical atrocities and inequities. That may be true, but but for, for an African-American mother to say, I don't trust the medical system if I have a three times higher chance than a white mother um, to die is, is, is not just a matter of trust. It's a matter of actually reading the odds and, uh, and, uh, and disparities in the healthcare system, right? And science, and this is the last thing, um, continues to, to make unforced errors. And, 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 I, I, and those are interesting. One was when during COVID, we, we started doing sewage testing in, in dorms, for instance, and said, well, um, we, uh, we, um, we, we, this allows us to basically get at pre-symptomatic spread because we test all the sewage. And then the moment we get any pickup on viral load, we go and test everybody. Um, and the, the picture here is unfair because that's not the person who, who the quote is from. Um, but it was an interesting quote in the New York Times um, of a scientist saying, well, what we're going to do, we know this is going to be controversial. We know this is going to have highly problematic applications potentially for law enforcement and other things. So we'll do the same thing we did with Facebook. We get buy-in on campuses where it's easier, and then we roll it out elsewhere once we get high trust and then get, get uptake from there. So aside from the fact that it's a pretty cynical thought inside your head, the idea that a scientist actually goes and talks to the New York Times and says this on the record as a strategy for, for reaching out, I think, tells us a lot about how much work we have to do on, on better science communication. So with that, and hopefully not having gone dramatically over, I, I, I noticed that I've gone over a little bit. Um, I'll turn it back to Heather and, and, and everybody else and really looking forward to hearing um, what you guys think. Thank you so much for having me again. Thank you. So much to process there, right? I'm sure that um, you know these are topics that have been touched on today and yesterday. Um, but I welcome, I mean, we have we have about five minutes. I want to go ahead and if anybody wants to raise a hand, they're welcome to as well or um, post anything uh, in the chat. Someone wishes this was an hour instead of 30 minutes. <laughs> I'm sure we all do. <laughs> 
And if I had learned to prepare my slides well, it would have been, my talks would have been shorter. My apologies. Yeah. Very interesting thoughts here. People are commenting. I'm looking forward to seeing if anybody has any pushback on any of the ideas. Yeah. I mean, I think feel free to share any push pushback. Um, I think, you know, I don't want to take up all the time, but we tend to fall into these kind of simplistic models, right? It's either knowledge deficit, trust deficit, and that it might be, um, you know, you're proposing it's it's much more complex. Um, and, and on the point, just really quickly on the, um, on the, on the point about liberals. Um, and there's also one of the things that we get very often, we just got a review for, for from a journal editor who says, well, you know, I think the difference is that scientists also, they always use the best available evidence and don't rely on, on, on shortcuts or heuristics. And there's actually great work in, and that was published in PNAS on, on, for example, gender biases in academia that shows really nicely, not only do we all engage in gender biases, actually males and females both do it in academia, um, but when you tell academics, when you show them the research that shows that 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 we engage in biases in payment and how we write letters and how we evaluate grants, male scientists are more likely to rate that research as poor. So they basically go like, oh, that that's that must be bad research because if it's good research, I'm biased. So I'm basically motivatedly reasoning my my way out of responsibility. So so just to to um, to Anne's a, a second element to Anne's point that also works for motivated reasoning, the exact same thing. And I see that that Jackie has her hand up. Hey, you turn to see you again. Uh, so thanks for the talk. Um, yeah, my question is: so starting off in the beginning, you were uh, showing some misconceptions, including uh, trust deficit, as that's not what's responsible for science deni denialism. And then later you start to show studies that talk about the role of uh, trust in these very specific ways. Um, so can you clarify a little bit that bridge the difference between that initial, it's not trust deficit, but it is trust in these roles. Yep, yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the by deficit, when I set it up at the beginning, what I, and that's a really good question, um, the, and, and, a, and a really good observation. The, the, when, I set the def, when I set up the deficit argument in the beginning, what I mean is, uh, it's not necessarily for all of them. Does it? Does that mean that knowledge doesn't matter? No, absolutely, knowledge matters, right? For knowledge deficits, for trust deficit, does it not? Does it mean that trust doesn't matter? No, trust absolutely matters. Uh, does good storytelling can it matter in some scenarios? Absolutely. Um, does some misinformation get corrected? Need to get corrected? Absolutely. So that's not at all what I'm saying with that. What I'm saying with that is that the next step typically is. Well, if we can just address this one pathology, then we're going to be better off and, and people are going to buy into the science. And for all four, that's just research has shown again and again that that can work in some circumstances. And I showed you, for example, the one with, with less religious people. It was very much a knowledge deficit type positive link on attitudes, uh, but sometimes it cannot. And so for trust, same thing. Trust is absolutely important. How much is an interesting question. And I don't think we have it, it's it's not that a linear curve that the, the more trust we have, the better democratically or 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 otherwise. Um, but that doesn't mean that trust is not crucially important. And it's and and just to illustrate that point for all of us, most of us on this call, I'm assuming, believe that climate change is real and believe that vaccines are safe um, within you know acceptable margins and so on and so forth. But we've we haven't read the primary research. We haven't you know we we many cases don't have the qualifications to understand the primary research. So that already tells you how that deference towards science or, or a trusting the process uh, is, is crucially important. Uh, the, the kinds of deficits that we're intuiting are just not there. Uh, science continues to be one of the most trusted institutions. And the gaps um, are, yes, partly driven by some decline among Republicans, but they're also largely driven um, by Democrats having, having um, turned this into a into something that they can rally around. And as I said, um, both Biden saying science is back and Obama, when he came in um, talking about restoring science to their rightful place, um, probably unintentionally didn't didn't help. So uh, but a really good observation. And then I don't know, Heather, if we have time to I see one more in the chat. Yeah, maybe we could do this um, This one more. Um, how do you think these general trust issues interact with personified trust with science scientists? 
with personified, I don't know what that yeah, means. I'm wondering if it's like, and Adrian, I don't know if you're still on and um, you wanna um, unmute and ask. Yeah, hi, I'm here. Thank you. Um, great talk. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering, so there's the idea of general trust in science, but people interact with science as a body of facts, but they also interact with people they see or people self-identifying as scientists. And those seem like yep. two different things like an yep. issue in general science, but then like a trust for how you interact with individuals presenting as scientists. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're putting your finger on something that's beginning to emerge as an area of research. Um, uh, I know that the Annenberg Public Policy Center is about to come out with some data um, that does not just the institution versus specific scientists, and, and those could even be science type people like an MD who you end up encountering on a regular basis or a, or a nurse or, or other things, um, but also a scientist in particular fields, climate science versus, um, I don't know, nuclear energy versus um, engineers and so on and so forth, um, but also content areas. So I, I think you're absolutely right that um, that the, the general, and, and, and then of course, institutional and agency related trust when we really saw the CDC tank. Um, and if you look at the the Northeastern, Northwestern uh, Rutgers data, the 50 states COVID survey, they really showed nicely how the how COVID trust tanked dramatically, uh, how, how CDC trust tanked dramatically among Republicans. So that's that's another dimension is, is agencies and, and mission agencies. Uh, so I think you're absolutely right. That needs a, a lot more um, research. And that's I think that's beginning to really, uh, people are beginning to, to do a, a deep dive into that post COVID. And Jackie went up to that uh, that question as well. So um, sorry that we can't respond to all of these. I, I completely agree that I wish we had an hour of your time to discuss this in more detail, but I hope that um, everybody can kind of carry these ideas um, with them throughout the rest of the conference and beyond. Um, and just wanna thank Dietram so much for joining us today as a featured speaker. Um, you all can move on to the next item on the agenda of our conference. Um, and thank you all so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> <laughs>